Okay, so today, present good day, we'll be looking at chapter 13, which involves the respiratory system. All right, so the respiratory system is indeed something that is uh, important to us. Uh, what we are seeing here is what we'll be looking at in just a little while. This is the lab, which relates to the heart and the tissues associated with the heart itself. So we'll be looking at this in just a second. But in terms of the focus right now, it would be on the respiratory system. All right. Before I start, let me just quickly have a look. I'm seeing there's a, a message in the chat. Did Sir call the roll? He surely did. But what I'll do once we finish, I will call it again. So if you didn't happen to hear your name, the roll will be updated. I'll do that at the end of class. Let's go. So respiratory system, is it important? What is it important for? What do we use the respiratory system for? Anybody? What is the importance of the respiratory system? The energy. Energy, dot, 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 dies down the road. And in terms of energy, what does the respiratory system do for us? What specifically, why do we, if somebody were to rip out your quote unquote respiratory system from your body, what would happen? Speak with the ancestors, sir. You'll speak with the ancestors, point taken. But before you have that chit chat with the ancestors, what would happen to your body? If you did not have that respiratory system, you know, before you have that discussion with the ancestors, what would happen? Very simply, what would happen? You will not be able to do what? Well, let me breathe. Breathe, yeah. Breathe. So, breathing, in terms of breathing, we have two types of, of breathing. When you think about breathing, are you taking in of air? One, we have the one pulmonary respiration involving your lungs. And then we have tissue respiration in which that oxygen, which is what is extracted from the air, gets into the cells, the tissues themselves. So sometimes you hear tissue or cellular respiration. That refers to the oxygen moving from the bloodstream into the tissue. And then you have pulmonary respiration that refers to the oxygen getting from the atmosphere into the bloodstream itself. So in terms of the functions of the respiratory system, the major ones, supplying the cells with oxygen, it most critically takes off the CO2. CO2 is produced as a waste product as it relates to respiration itself. When you're thinking about the breakdown of food, when you look at glucose plus oxygen, it gives you carbon dioxide, water, and of course, energy. So both water and carbon dioxide are byproducts of respiration. And in fact, in some animals, what comes to mind is a kangaroo rat from Australia. Kangaroo rat has adaptation. It lives in the desert. And what it actually does as it eats the food and breaks it down and it produces that water, water is scarce. So it has mechanisms, it has adapted its um, body such that that water that is produced is not let out into the atmosphere in terms of breathing, but is actually retained in the body itself. So you could say the rat, um, kangaroo rat manufactures water from the food it, it eats. And instead of it going out in the exhaled air, it is actually kept in. So the air that it breathes out is very dry. Is, is the air that we breathe out, is it moist or is it very dry? And how could we tell? It has a very easy test to do, to check if, you, if the air that you breathe out is moist or dry. Hmm. And it involves- It's moist. It is moist, correct. And how moist. could we check to see if it's moist? Like if you breathe against a glass. Correct, it's right. If you breathe against a glass, right, a mirror. If you breathe, you'll see condensation, you'll see droplets forming on the mirror itself. And back in the day as well, I always remember I was talking to a old cousin of mine and she was mentioning, you know, when people, um, <laughs> what they used to do if somebody was, was claimed to be, you know, recently died or what have you not, what they would do is take a, a mirror and put under their nose. Right, just to make sure that they're not breathing, right? So I don't know. You could talk to somebody old, your older um, relatives and see if they used to do that. You know, put a mirror on the person knows a recent descendant. You know, somebody who has passed, they'd put a mirror on the nose and then check to see if it have any, you know, condensate formed on the mirror. Respiratory system functions. Supply cells with oxygen, rids the body of CO2. It brings odor onto the nose. We would have, you would have looked at that in SNF1 in terms of digestion as part of the digestive system, right? And which is why when you have a cold, food tastes funny, right? You find that things don't taste as well because both the, um, your, your, in terms of stimulation, both 
tongue sensation in terms of chemoreceptors there and odor, odoriferous uh, sensors in the nose, both of them combine to give that sensation we know as taste. So which is why if one is affected, let's say in terms of a cold, well, the food tastes funny because you're only getting that sensation then from the tongue itself. And of course, the respiratory system is important because it vibrates vocal cords for speech. And uh, in terms of that movement of air, the, epiglot the epiglottis is very critical at that in directing the air down the trachea such that it passes over the vocal cords uh, to, so that you could get uh, speech being um, given off by the individual. All right, so the respiratory system, the airways, and these airways ultimately go down to the lungs. And why do we have two lungs? Why not just one lung? One word beginning with B. One word beginning with B. Reading. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Yes, yes. But as why? So let me expand. We have two lungs. We have two kidneys. And it's the same one. The reason why we have another one is because in case one fail, and why is that word? It begins with B. Balance. Balance. Right. I hear what you're saying. So you have this balance in case of a backup was the word I was looking for. But all those other things which you mentioned, they would have relevance in terms of the topic. So I see where you all were heading. But the one word I was looking for was backup, right? As I mentioned back in the day, um, this is probably towards the uh, early 80s. Um, Calypsonian Penguin. He sang this song at Deputy Essential. You could look it up on YouTube. That's Google YouTube Penguin Deputy Essential, you know, in which he, he surmised that it's always good to have a backup in certain situations. While the double entendre of his Calypso might be speculative in terms of some persons looking at it, but the concept of what you're trying to be a deputy essential. Think about it like that in terms of the lungs are deputy essential. You have another lung in case something goes wrong with the first one. On that topic, the current Pope, Pope Francis, um, he has, uh, the majority of his lung was removed when he was about 19. He had a lung infection and that was before antibiotics came to the fore. So right now he's in his 80s, well into his 80s, and he's still alive. He's, he's the current Pope of the Catholic Church. And um, he, he has survived then over 60 odd years on just one lung. Well, <laughs> in essence, on just one lung, because most of his, one of his lungs was removed, which has goes to show that whole concept of backup is critical. That's about it. Yeah, go ahead. The, if we have one lung, if we could survive mm -hmm. on, one, on one lung, that means our arm. Um, we basically would survive on a, on a lesser oxygen capacity. Correct. So you wouldn't expect him then, even while he was growing up, in terms of, let's say, doing certain things that normal people, like, let's say, run full out for 100 meters, you know, certain things that re that would require high oxygen content, you know, processing. So it would be, it would have been lower, you know, he would have been measured in terms of his activities. But the bottom line is, as I mentioned, oh, 70 years, he's still alive, which is a remarkable accomplishment. If you just had one lung and something going wrong with it, well, then you'd be having that discussion with the ancestors earlier than expected. Yeah. Okay, so let's go. So respiration, pulmonary ventilation. So the air comes into the lungs and then it moves from the lungs into the blood. And of course the oxygen is most critical because it gets into the different tissue cells and in the cells themselves is used to break down glucose. And once the glucose is broken down, it generates glucose plus oxygen gives you waste product, carbon dioxide and water and the most critical product of them all energy, energy in the form of ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And this ATP then is used for muscle contraction. It's very important for muscle contraction, right? So always remember that. And that is the major reason why we actually um, take in oxygen. We take in that oxygen to break down food uh, to generate ATP, which is primarily used for muscle contraction, as shown in this case when we are seeing this individual uh, going on a little run. So let's have a quick look at the structures of the respiratory tract. The frontal sinus, so here is could be taken in either via the nasal or oral cavity because of the fact they, they both join right here. 
in terms of in the pharyngeal or the pharynx region. So the bow joint, you have the nasopharynx and the oropharynx. This, these are the areas just posterior to the nasal and oral cavity, cavities respectively. And they then go down. Of course, you have the esophagus here, the esophagus or gullet that leads to your stomach. So that's why it's critical to have the epiglottis over it. Now, let me see if I could blow this up a bit, make it a little larger. Mm. Okay. So here it is, we have uh, the, ph the pharynx and here is the larynx. So the larynx, uh, also known, the larynx right here, this is your voice box. Uh, the trachea, this goes down, of course, to the lungs itself. And what we will notice, the trachea, is cart it has cartilage over it. Why is it important that you have cartilage over your trachea? It's a very important reason. Right, is you have cartilage. The cartilage serves a function, a specific function. Anybody? So it's just like you know, um, what does what does the cartilage do? So yeah, cartilage Excuse would, sir. Yes. The a cartilage would um, so, go ahead. It would support. It would support, support the structure. It will help the trachea to maintain the structure. Very true. The true. shape Very of good. it to Very keep good. it open wide. Very true, Daniel. Yes, Kiran, you wanted to add to that. I didn't hear what you said. You said one. Or a cushion, or a cushion at all, later, sir. Yeah, it adds some cushion or structure to the trachea itself, such that it keeps it open. Is it important for our airway to keep open? Let's say if we were sleeping and it didn't have this rigid, um, so it's cartilage over it to keep it open. What would happen to the trachea? If we didn't have something to keep it open, what would happen to it? It will close and you it can't collapse. Breathe. Yes. And then you wouldn't be able to breathe and then you'll be having that chit chat with the ancestors. So this is very important, the trachea, in terms of keeping the airways open. So then we have the trachea. You'd hear this word often spoken, bifurcates. It's a nice word, I just mean it splits into two. Trachea bifurcates going to each lung and it now becomes the bronchi. The bronchi gets even smaller to the bronchioles. And at the end of the bronchioles, if you were to look, you have these air sacs, look like a bunch of grapes. And actually the word for Latin is alveoli is very close to the Latin word for grapes. Uh, for a bunch of grapes. So it's a bunch of, or it looks like a bunch of grapes or a bunch of chenet or a bunch of piwa. It looks like that, you know, it's a bunch of these circular uh, structures. And these form, these are really the air sacs. A crisscross in these alveoli are the capillaries. And it is very important to note that gaseous exchange or the exchange of air only happens at this level, at the level of the alveoli. That's the only place that it happens. You know, some people think, well, you know, you have these two big lungs. Uh, no, 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 it's only at the ends, at the level of the alveoli, which are crisscrossed with capillaries, do you have this exchange of air occurring. Okay, so the conducting zone, you know, so within the nasal pharynx or the nasal cavity, we do have the cells, the cells giving off mucus. And that mucus is important for trapping particles to prevent them going down into the lungs itself. Now, these particles could be in the form of food. If it's food, of course, that's an issue. That can lead to infection in the lung or it could represent microorganisms. So they are trapped in the uh, mucus that is given off, sometimes referred to as catar, you might hear it, C-A-T-A-R-R-H, or more in the parlance is known as snat, right? So when you blow that snat, yes, that is the mucus, and sometimes it does have as well, in, within it, it has different things that are trapped. So when we are looking at the nose and throat, these are it in section, 
cross section, you'd notice that the sinus, sinus shown here, and this is the nasal cavity, the oral, ca the oral cavity, which have these different structures. And here we see the epiglottis. So you see the epiglottis is shown here. It is, has a muscle associated with it. And it could move, if it moves down here, this of course is the trachea, the windpipe. If it blocks up the, tr the trachea, well, things go down the esophagus, which is shown here on the outer part. So this epiglottis is very important. And if you had an issue with this muscle, if this muscle wasn't functioning, what risk do you run then? If this wasn't functioning at all? Right, so the epiglottis couldn't close down to allow food to go down to your stomach. What, what, what risk would you run? Well, you run the risk of food going down into your lungs, which is uh, if food goes down into your lungs, that could lead to infection. And that is a place where you really don't want to be in terms of infection. So that is why it doesn't happen very often, but sometimes maybe even in your professional career, you might come across some person who had, let's say, some type of facial trauma because so they have damage to this muscle and the epiglottis isn't working, is non-functional. In a case like that, in terms of feeding, I think we mentioned this previously, in terms of feeding, they will have have to use, you know, um, have a uh, the food given directly to their stomach. So they have to have, um, you know, surgery and an insertion point made directly to the stomach and it has to be injected into the stomach, right? Or have a feeding tube. No, not a feeding tube because the person will be, nothing else is wrong with them, but they usually make an incision into the stomach and then they just inject it directly into the stomach in terms of the nutrients. All right, this is uh, showing another section in terms of the, uh, the head itself. All right, so this is the larynx and the trachea. So the larynx is the voice, part, voice box. The pharynx, or, or remember the pharyngeal region, if you were to go back, not to sometimes, the pharyngeal region consists of both the nasal and the oropharynx. So that's the, that's the area that is posterior to the nasal and oral cavities. Whereas the larynx, and this is the area superior to the trachea itself. And that's the voice box. And then of course it bifurcates into the left and right bronchi. So bronchi is singular, bronchi is plural. In terms of the thyroid cartilage, um, usually with males, the thyroid cartilage is more pronounced. So therefore males have you know, a, a bigger Adam's apple. Right? So that is usually sometimes one way of checking to see if it's male or female, just by looking at somebody, you can see that prominent thyroid cartilage, which is known as the Adam's apple. Here we're showing the larynx. And again, these are the vocal cords. Some people have very well developed or trained vocal cords and they sing very well. Whereas some persons, well, they're not so good at any singing, but this, this sometimes has a lot to do with training. All right, so if it is you find you don't sing too well, well, you could always take some training and you will improve in that regard. This here is showing in terms, this is what we mentioned previously. I'll just get into it, uh, get a little zoom on it. Uh, Right, so what this is showing here, the trachea bifurcates to the bronchi, the bronchi to the bronchioles, and down to the alveoli. So this is showing the alveoli or the air spaces within those grapes. So we mentioned like a bunch of grapes, a bunch of chanat, a bunch of pure, but they're really hollow because this is where the air comes in. It is crisscrossed with capillaries. Remember capillaries are one cell thick. Not only are they one cell thick, but they also have spaces in between them. So that's why capillaries other than other blood vessels are used to crisscross these alveoli or the air spaces. Remember the air is coming down, it's coming down, it's coming down, and it goes into this bunch of chenet. And then crisscrossing on the outside of the chenet is the capillaries so that the air now could actually diffuse across into the capillaries. Why? Because capillaries are very unique in that they have spaces. They're, well, two things. One, they're one cell thick. And secondly, they have spaces between the cells. So the air could actually go into the, um, go into the capillaries. So that's something that is very important in terms of a concept. Capillaries, very useful in terms of providing that function.
So gaseous exchange occurs in the respiratory zone and the, al the, the respiratory zone, which is of course the ducts and the alveoli. The alveoli are these bunches and everywhere, the region that is crisscrossed by these capillaries. This just speaks about the lung structure. Which lung, let me see, let me ask you this. Which lung do you think is larger, your right lung or your left lung and why? I think you might have seen this when you were looking at the cardiovascular system. And just by my saying, saying that, I kind of gave away the answer. Which lung do you think is larger, the left or the right? So the right. The right lung, right. And why, why is the left lung smaller? It makes it space for the heart. Correct. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Alexis and Judith. That's very good. So to make space for the heart, the left lung is actually smaller than the right lung itself. So this is, you see it uh, quite clearer here, clearer here, the left lung and the right lung to have this space for the heart. Remember the heart is the apex of the heart, always points to the left. And that is why it has this indentation or notch associated with the left lung itself. So the lungs, so here's the lungs. The lungs, of course, they're, under, they're pressurized and they have a, a pleura or a membrane around it. And this pleura, also has its, its it has this pleural cavity that has fluid in it, very similar to the heart itself. Of course, if it is, uh, if you do have a puncture, such as a stab wound, you could have a collapsing of the lung itself. So in terms of fixing, quote unquote, what they have to do, they'd have to, most critically, they have to uh, suture up this puncture first before the lung could be reinflated, would be reinflated by the um, by a normal breathing. But they have to suture this is very important. All right, now we come to something that is central to breathing and it involves the Boyle's law, this pressure law, right? So what is Boyle's law? Boyle's law states that pressure times volume is equal to some constant, some constant value, K, right? So they've always found that, you know, uh, pressure times a specific volume, when you're looking at a particular volume, the pressure multiplied by that volume, it gives you this constant, pressure times volume is this constant value. So if you were to remember, uh, from maths, if we wanted to isolate volume on this side, what would we have to do to both sides? If we just wanted volume, you know, from maths, what we have to divide, divide both, sides, both by, sides by P. By P, quite right. So if we divide both sides by P, right, we'd have, right, this P would disappear and then we'd have K over P. Now a constant value, if it's constant, you could use, you could approximate it to one because it doesn't change. So in essence, what Boyle's law says, volume is equal to one over P. And that is known as inversely proportional. Okay, that sounds a little bit um, much. What does inversely proportional mean? Let's think of a seesaw. Think back to your girl days or your boy days as it will. And everybody familiar with a seesaw? Because I know these days, some person, you know, they're more electronically inclined. They might not have a clue what is. I think everybody knows, familiar with a seesaw, yeah? Yes, sir. All right, so if yes, not, sir. yeah. So in terms of a seesaw, a seesaw has two sides. When one side goes up, the other side goes down. And when you're thinking about volume and pressure, that's how to visualize it as it relates to breathing. One, whenever you're speaking about breathing, you always do it from the perspective of volume. All right, so that is one of the things to remember, right? Always think about it in terms of volume. Um, in terms of explaining it. Two, so you, you put volume and pressure on opposite sides of the seesaw. So think about it, volume and pressure on opposite sides. What would happen then if volume goes up? What will happen to pressure? Would it go up or down? If volume goes up, what would happen to pressure? Down. pressure will go down. If you're thinking about a seesaw, yeah, it would go down. And if volume goes down, what happens to pressure? Does it go up or down? Pressure will go up. Right. So that, that concept, once you have that concept in your mind, yeah, it would help explain how you breathe in. Now, how does that relate to breathing in? Let's see if you could relate that. All right. So we're breathing in. You breathe in, you breathe out. You breathe in, you breathe out. When you breathe in, what is happening to the... Now, remember, when you're explaining it, always start 
with volume. You're explaining it in terms of volume as it relates to your lungs. When you're breathing, what happens um, at the level of your lungs? Well, you have the intercostal muscles. Those are the muscles that run between your ribs. And then, of course, there's the main, the main um, muscle associated with respiration is this one down here. What is this muscle, muscle called again? I forget. It begins your with diaphragm. The, your diaphragm, yeah. So there's a major muscle here. So when you breathe in, right, the volume of your lungs increase because of the action of the intercostal muscles which run between the diaphragm, sorry, between the ribs. And then, of course, you have this one. These are the two major ones, the diaphragm and the intercostal. So it increases the volume of the lungs. Now, when the volume, uh, when the volume goes up, what happens to the pressure? Back to the seesaw. When the volume goes up, pressure, go down. pressure goes down. So therefore, the pressure in your lungs goes down relative to outside external atmospheric pressure. Pressure is down or lower. And when you're thinking about things moving as relating to diffusion or pressure differential, how do things generally move? Do they move from high to low or low to high? When they're, from an area of high concentration to low? Yeah, in terms of diffusion. And it's the same thing with pressure. In terms of how things move, they move from an area of high pressure to low pressure. So what happens when, you, when the intercostal muscles and the diaphragm increase the volume of the lung, right? Because they, they increase the size of the lung, so the volume increases. When the volume increases, the pressure decreases. And outside, the pressure is high relative to this. So what happens is literally air is sucked in. It goes from high pressure to low pressure, and the air moves into your lungs. And the reverse happens as well. When you breathe out, what happens? Well, the intercostal muscles contract. The diaphragm comes back up into its dome position because this is when it's at rest. So what happens to the volume? The volume goes down. So if the volume goes down, what happens to the pressure inside your lungs? It increases. Right. Remember seesaw, right? So volume goes down, the pressure goes up. So therefore, relative to the external environment, we're thinking out here is the internal environment, right? So volume decreases, uh, the pressure is high relative to outside the external environment. So what happens in terms of the movement of air? Moves from the area of high pressure to low. And literally, the air sucks out of your lungs. So in terms of that movement in and out, into, how do you explain it? It's explained in terms of Boyle's law, in terms of that motion in and out of the lungs. It is literally sucked in and sucked out as it relates to that movement. All right, so uh, do, and that is what is actually um, mentioned here in terms of those, that concept, all these concept, that is what I just, I just mentioned it. So you could have a look at the lecture, the recorded lecture. It does explain the same thing in, in a little more detail, but in essence, um, that is what happens in terms of the movement of air into and out of your lungs itself. Major muscles associated, we mentioned the diagram, intercostals, and the sternocleidomastoid. This is the, those are really the three, the three muscles associated with movement into and out of the lungs. And keep those three in mind whenever you hear about respiration. The major two, diaphragm and intercostals, but the sternocleidomastoid also um, is also the third one that actually assists in terms of ventilation. All right. So that's, we're talking about external or pulmonary ventilation, movement of air into the lungs. Now let's talk about alveolar. How does it get into the lungs, it's into the tissues? Now this, what you're looking at here, this lung volume and capacities um, graph that is shown here, you'll be well placed to revisit it because this usually comes from multiple choice questions. All right. It explains the total volumes. Again, this, in terms of the total lung capacity, you have the vital and the residual. We never really blow out all the, all the air in our lungs. And this just shows the division. So at your leisure, when, we, when you go to the uh, lecture on the lungs, uh, you should revisit it. But do keep these numbers in mind. You will see these again. They usually come from multiple choice questions. 
All right, spirometer, this is how long capacity is measured in terms of blowing in and out. And that's how they actually measure, you know, the lung capacity. The partial pressures, this is a measure of the oxygen content. This is useful to explain how air passes in and out, out of cells, because what we're looking at is the partial pressure or the pressure contributed by oxygen. If you're looking at inspiration, if you're looking at the movement of air into the cells, and then you look at the partial pressure or the pressures contributed by CO2, these are the two major gases involved. So partial pressures, uh, these are important. To, the concept is important to know. So let's see how that works at the level of the lungs in terms of external. So at the level of the lungs, we have the alveolus. And here it is, we have a capillary crisscrossing the alveolus and the movement, it moves from the, when the, the, within the capillary itself, when the partial pressure of the oxygen is lower, well, it moves from high to low, it gets in. Partial pressure of CO2 is relatively high as compared to the air in the alveolus. So therefore the CO2 diffuses out into the lungs itself. So that's how you have this gaseous exchange occurring inside of the lungs itself. Now, how is this carbon dioxide transported? Well, the majority of carbon dioxide is transported as bicarbonate ions within the blood. Let's have a specific look at that. The alveolus, here you have the blood supply within the capillary and here you have a red blood cell. Within the red blood cell, you have a protein hemoglobin Hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen, so HB, this is hemoglobin unattached. And what you find happening, the oxygen comes in, is diffused in, and it saturates then the receptors on the uh, red blood cell itself. So this HB in blue, this is just representative of the protein hemoglobin that is present without any oxygen. So when it, when it is in the presence of oxygen, you can think about hemoglobin and red blood cells. Think about it like a hemoglobin. It's known as oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a protein and oxygen is bound to it to form that substance, oxyhemoglobin. And that's how it's carried in the blood until it comes, let's say, to a tissue and where the oxygen concentration is lower. By diffusion, the oxygen will be released and it gets into the cell. When it gets into the cell, Oxygen plus food gives you carbon dioxide, water, and energy. Energy in the form of ATP. And that's how you have formation of energy occurring at the level of the cell. Now, of course, the hemoglobin, it continually goes around. Now it is, it has given off its oxygen. So it's just now the hemoglobin alone, the protein without any oxygen. Whereas over here, this is the hemoglobin plus oxygen. This is oxyhemoglobin. But here now is just plain hemoglobin, HB, without the oxygen, because this oxygen was given off, goes into the cell, and that oxygen is used to combine with food. Glucose gives you carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And that's how ATP is made or manufactured in the cell. And that is as a two, in terms of glycolysis at the level of the cytoplasm. So if you're looking at the breakdown of glucose, glucose is in the cell is taken in and is waiting there to be broken down. Oxygen comes in and now we could start glycolysis. It's broken down to pyruvate. Pyruvate is then shuttled into the mitochondria where oxidative phosphorylation occurs, leading to the generation of ATP. So usually with one breakdown, the breakdown of one glucose molecule, you have 33 to 36 ATP being generated per cell. All right, so CO2 transport, we looked at oxygen transport and breakdown. Now let's talk about CO2. CO2 is transported as bicarbonate ions in the blood. I said, just, that is an important concept. It's not carried, even though some, five to 10% is dissolved in the plasma, but the majority, about 80%, is converted into bicarbonate ions. And this is how it's actually transported in the blood itself. Oxygen, so you mentioned oxygen transport, majority of the oxygen bound to uh, hemoglobin, carbon dioxide, some is dissolved in the plasma, majority transported as bicarbonate ion. Now let's talk about breathing, our normal respiration rate. This is about 12 breaths a minute, with inspiration taking about two, <laughs> expiration about three seconds, right? So if it's five, 12, five, six, day, 
So therefore, the normal respiration rate is uh, 12 breaths a minute. The respiratory uh, control center is located in your brainstem. You have your um, collection of neurons in the brainstem that initiates the respiration and modulates it in response to chemical factors. Right? You have the ventral respiratory group and the dorsal and pontine respiratory group right, within the brainstem, and these fine tune it. So do remember right here, you have your brain, your brain stem, that portion there, and these are responsible for actually keeping that rhythm going. Um, sometimes I don't like to draw reference to gun violence, but I don't know if, if some people know, you know, the uh, sometimes you see that uh, they put somebody to to like kneel down to shoot them, you know, and they, they bend their head forward and then they'll put the gun, you know, let's say above the level, uh, like to the tip of your neck. Even though they're probably not aware of it, what they're actually shooting is this, your respiratory system, your, your brainstem. And if they blow that out, bow, do you, could you go to a hospital and get a replacement respiratory system? Sorry, respiratory center, uh, the brainstem, the answer is absolutely not. I'm not saying you would ever be in this situation, but if ever you're in a situation like that, you know, and somebody wants to line up a gun, let's say to the back of your head, it's better to run. You stand a much better chance than having them shoot you because once they click there, right, you'll be chit-chatting with the ancestors virtually immediately because when they shoot you right behind your neck there, if you put a gun in, they're, they're blowing out, they're blowing out your respiratory center. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to breathe at all. There's no longer any control over your breathing and that will be the end of you. So you stand a better chance of running, right? Always remember that. And like I say, I don't like giving examples of violence, but just to drive home the point of the importance of the um, respiratory center and its location in the brainstem. Any questions? No, sir, not so far. Not so far. Let's go on. So I have one question. Go ahead. Though. Go ahead, Anessa. In terms of the respiratory system, you say 12 beats per minute for an adult. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to clarify why does babies um, breathe more rapidly or faster? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Let's throw it out there. Anybody, why do babies breathe faster, the respiratory rate? So when you're looking at the respiratory rate for adults, the respiratory rate is approximately, as quite rightly said, is approximately 12 breaths per minute. But for babies, you'd find that is a lot. babies actually breathe faster. The respiratory is sometimes about 40 to 60 times a minute. Well, for newborns, that is. So why it is, why it is children breathe faster? What do you think? Because the body is smaller, so it that has something to do with it. Okay, the body is smaller. So, well, I'm thinking it's something oh, to do with the oh, lung development. I just don't yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah. You hit the nail on the head. The lung's smaller in terms of the development. When you're thinking, when you look at an adult, the relative to the body size, right, the lungs are a lot bigger. <coughs> Excuse me. The lungs are bigger. But for a baby, it's smaller. So, therefore, to get the same amount of oxygen, they have to breathe faster. That's the best thing I could think of. I don't know if anybody... Um, have any other any other um, explanation? But that's the best one in terms of body size and the size of the lungs. Yeah, it's not it's not as well developed as a full grown adult. You know, so the full grown adult, the lungs are very well developed, and therefore the respiratory rate, the resting respiratory rate, it is a lot lower. Whereas with an infant, newborn in particular. Uh, the lungs are still developing and they're still getting bigger, increasing in mass. So it's not as well. Uh, so they have to breathe faster for the same function to occur. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sir. Understood. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. All right. So let's go. Uh, so that's the respiratory control center. And you also have chemoreceptors. So there's the interesting thing, if we were just to jump back here, let me just mention it real quick. If you notice, in terms of giving off oxygen, even in this example here, notice that some oxygen is actually left bound. Not all the oxygen is actually given off. And huh, this, this is important uh, in terms of a concept. Oh, there's something on the chart. Yeah, it sure was. 
Mm -hmm. um, and it relates to people who have asthma. Now, some, let me throw this out. Sometimes you'd hear that, you know, persons who have an asthma attack, what do you do? You take a brown bag and you put over their mouth. I don't know if you ever heard it, put, put it over their nose and mouth. Yes, sir. And have them breathe into it. And breathe into it. Now, why? Why is that? It's That sounds, it sounds kind of crazy, right? These person, the people are trying to breathe, but here it is, you're covering their nose and their mouth with a bag. And by sense, what sense would say is, well, you know, you're breathing out carbon dioxide. So therefore they'll be re they're breathing back in carbon dioxide. How is that helping them? Anybody wants to give an explanation? Why is that? Actually it does work, but why do they do that? And it has something to do, I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with this reserve oxygen, you see. So what do you think, when carbon dioxide levels are high, what do you think happens to this reserve oxygen? They go get you, sir. Thank you, it's released. The only way you could get this reserve, so in other words, when we are breathing, normally, when we breathe in and out, there's a reserve oxygen that is carried in the, in the blood cells all the time. It's just a reserve. The only way you could get it off is by, if you increase the carbon dioxide levels in the blood, and that's the chemoreceptors detected. And what it does, it actually causes, well, the, the, um, the high level of carbon dioxide present in the blood, it causes the release of carbon dioxide, sorry, of the oxygen from the hemoglobin. So which is why when somebody has an asthmatic attack, of course they need oxygen, you cover their mouth with a bag, brown bag, <laughs> Increase the CO2, that increase in the CO2 causes the oxygen to be released. Now, this has a lot to do, that's just the simple explanation for it. It has a lot to do, there's a, a, a biochemical component as to why it happens, but it's beyond the scope of this class. But just appreciate that fact that, you know, when somebody does have an asthmatic attack, increasing CO2 will lead to oxygen, an immediate release of oxygen in the blood. And if a person, I don't know if anybody has uh, relatives or, anybody, or you have ever seen somebody with an asthmatic attack and that actually done, but it brings down their breathing relief quickly, you know, in terms of that release of oxygen. Anybody ever saw it done? No, sir. No, okay. But yeah, but, it, what it, that, but that's the explanation behind it. It causes the release of that reserve oxygen. Okay. And that will be the end of the respiration lecture for today. So what we looked at in terms of respiration, we looked at, of course, at the organs of respiration, the lungs. We looked at the oral, the passage in terms of the oxygen, what it takes from the nasal and oral, uh, oral cavities to the oropharynx down the trachea, bifurcating into the bronchi, bronchioles, and then the terminal uh, bronchi, bronchioles. These bronchioles are surrounded by alveoli, and within the alveoli, you have the exchange of gases, oxygen and CO2. The movement of air from the external environment down to the level of the lungs is known as pulmonary ventilation or pulmonary respiration, right? And then the, um, the oxygen now gets into the blood. The movement of that oxygen from the blood into the cell or tissue is known as cellular or tissue respiration. What do we do with the oxygen? Oxygen plus food gives you carbon dioxide, water, and most critically, energy, energy in the form of ATP. So in a nutshell, that oxygen is used to break down food to create energy, energy in the form of that ATP. Um, we didn't look, we also looked at the structure of the lungs itself, right? The, the particular uh, tissues making, well, the tissue that makes up the lung and how the passage occurs with the diffusion into the lung itself. Mentioned the carrying of the oxygen and CO2 in the blood. Oxygen is carried uh, virtually on hemoglobin to, in the form of oxyhemoglobin, whereas with CO2, the majority is carried in the form of, bi, of a bi, formation of a bicarbonate, approximately 80%, the majority of it does go through in that, in terms of the carriage in the blood itself. The CO2 then gets back to the lungs and it moves across by diffusion. Central to this diffusion concept or the movement of air into and out of the lungs, we also mention, of course, Boyle's law, in which pressure is inversely proportional to volume. 
when explaining the movement of air into and out of the lungs, it's always important to start from the perspective of volume and applying Boyle's law, which says that volume is inversely proportional to pressure. And that VP relationship could be considered as V and P being on opposite sides of a seesaw. So therefore, as volume goes up, pressure goes down, Right, so in the lungs, increase the volume through the actions of the intercostal diaphragm and the sternocleidomastoid muscle increases the volume, pressure goes down relative to the outside. How do things move from area of high pressure to low is sucked in and the reverse happens when you exhale. Okay, any questions? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Um, I always wanted to know, so when asthma patients mm -hmm. then as as marking up, why did us wheeze? You know, as the body does make a sound, kind of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, uh, why why the body does make a sound? That's a good question. Kind of That's a good question. Very good question. Anybody? So why do asthma patients wheeze? They try. What I'm guessing is, you know, they're, they're trying very hard to extract. I, I just never thought about that. That's a very good question. Well, so I think um, based on what I was told, they say that the on the alveolus level, like mm -hmm. there's a lot of mucus there. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the air is forcing to like be exchanged between the alveoli and the capillaries. And so mm -hmm. when they breathe, they get that they get that song. So that's how they know that, you know, some when some somebody's asthmatic, that's how they know that, you know, they have mucus which could lead to an infection and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yep. somewhere else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, great time. Uh, I'll look at it up here. Thanks very much there, Charles, in terms of that contribution. Um, I'm looking up in terms of the uh, wheezing associated uh, with asthma. And we're saying asthma wheezing is a whistling sound that happens when a person breathes through the narrowed airway passages in the lungs. So you actually, and it could be narrowed through mucus secre mucal secretion and also um, vasoconstriction is that it, it just gets, you know, cause breathe, you're breathing in normally it's, what could trigger, well, let, me, let me take a step back. What could actually trigger um, an asthma attack is the narrowing of the vessels brought about by mucus secretion. And this is in response sometimes to pollen, you know, or some other stimulant that causes this narrowing. So it's the air that is actually passing over this narrow, these narrowed passages that causes the wheezing noise that you hear associated with asthma. All right, so it's the bottom line, the air passing across, passing over the narrowed, um, passages leading to your lungs that causes that wheezing noise. The narrowed airway passages in the lungs. We're talking about the narrowed passages brought about by some stimulant, you know, some allergen or some something that causes the attack. I don't know if that answer your question. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it did because, you know, normally when um, mm -hmm. my son, when he was much smaller, uh -huh. he had a lot of asthma attacks and I, but I mean, I didn't know when he had asthma and just by hearing that noise. We, oh gosh, it, it's frightening, yeah. huh? Frightening. Yeah, so that is when we rush into the hospital, as soon as the doctor heard that noise, he don't say, hey, asthma. Yeah, of course, because yeah, they see it all the time. And what did they put him on? They put him on that, um, what is a nebulizer? Yes. They pay money machine number one time, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and, and then they stop, you know, once they start a bubble, they start a bubble. Well, it's a, what they give, given that nebulizer, they put a bronchodilator um, in the in the liquid, and um, and then, so you're breathing it, we're breathing it in an aerosol form, and that core opens out the passageway, and that's why the reason will stop. So it's really a product of the narrowed airways. And um, yeah, so using a bronchodilator. Of course, there's something else that you could take for person. <laughs> well, now it's legal. Yeah. So, yeah, so I where you could take as the, well. Um, I used to give him the weed root. Yeah, thing. yeah, marijuana, the, the active I, ingredient, that, right? Touch a high. Mm -hmm. so I rather that than the, um, the puff because I believe you grow out of it. Yeah. No, because basically, if I used to give him that puff, he body were continue asking for that and i mm -hmm. wanted him to 
come out of that asthma face. Mm-hmm. So now he don't, he don't act up. It's more like if, you know, well, we you know if he gets yeah. cold or whatever, yes, he might act up. But now he don't act up like how he used to before because I, I, I really don't give him that puff. Yeah, so you can puff or you can give it in, in form of a tea, you know, draw it. In terms of it, the active ingredient is Delta 7 tetrahydrocannabinoid. It's a class of drug, a cannabinoid. And yeah, it's very good. It's, it, known, it's a known bronchodilator, right? And it acts very quickly. So, you know, that's another thing. And as I said, now it's legal. So it's, it's not an issue in terms of prescribing it. But for years, they've prescribed it as quote unquote medicinal marijuana, right? But it's nothing more than yeah, marijuana. You draw a tea and you give it, and it does the job. You'll see. So for asthmatics, I spoke with met to many asthmatics, and they mentioned that to me, particularly those up in the country areas. You know, they, yeah, when they have an attack, they just do, you know, enjoy it and they drink it, drink the tea, and it stops. Yeah, the attack stops. So, yeah. But when you're drinking mm-hmm. it, it is, it is eat a lot, eh? Oh, yes. Because I, one of the things with, um, with uh, Delta 7, consumption of, of Delta 7 cannabinoids, yeah, it's what is known as the munchies. And that, that actually is used as a, as a very good thing for cancer patients, right? Because one of the things with cancer patients, cancer patients um, in, under chemotherapy, chemotherapy targets fast-growing cells, which are cancer cells. And also in your body, your fast-growing cells are your hair follicles and also the lining of your GI tract from mouth to anus, inclusive of your stomach, which is why your hair falls off when you're doing chemotherapy because the drug targets fast-growing cells to, right, to kill them off. Um, so persons under chemotherapy, I don't know if anybody has ever known persons and so one of the side effects sometimes it affects others more more so is that they don't want to eat right because the lining of the stomach right it literally you know is being is being killed off one of the good things however with the gi tract is constantly being replaced right but now you know it's being affected so the people don't persons don't usually feel to eat so one issue with chemotherapy is loss of weight because the person doesn't get proper nutrition so one day, one way to combat that is to give them <laughs> Delta 7 cannabinoids, aka weed, marijuana, and that opens their appetite. So that is actually used in conjunction in terms of chemotherapy, quote unquote medicinal marijuana, in terms of keeping the nutritional level of patients up. Okay? Good. Glad you bring it up. All right. So so this was the lecture. So let's go go over now to the lab. Let's see what's happening with the lab. So for those who just came in, I mentioned that today is, of course, um, a pre a prequel to the Christian's holy day tomorrow. So for some person, particularly for Catholics, today is also a day of preparation. So I decided to just have one class in which we'd look at lecture and lab. Everybody who were present at the start, you know, they agreed to it. Well, not everybody, but the respondents agreed to it. And um, so we now look at the lab. In terms of the full expanded lecture, it's already on the site, so you could click on it and have a look at it. I just touched on some salient points associated with the lecture. Now we're going to move over to the lab. So in terms of from the 11 to 2, we would not be having lab today. Okay, that's all right. Everybody good with that? Yes, sir. That's quite fine. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So let's get over now to the um, let's get over to the lab. Come on. <laughs> it's misbehaving. All right. So the lab, the lab. Um, so we look at the lab, then we look at the um, worksheet from last day, and then we'd call it a day. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, excuse, sir. Yes, go ahead. On the classroom, the yes. um worksheet for the the lab not there. It had a drop off box, but they don't know. That's oh, the twelve. Today? Yeah, number twelve. You all look at it today because I, I opened it up. I did. I opened it up about a, a couple of maybe about. Oh, it was closed. Hour, yeah, hour before okay. before class. Have a look when you're done and see. You mean for today's session? Yeah. So I open it up. Yeah, I just open it up. 
Oh, sir, and one more thing, please. Yes. I don't know if it's possible that you'll facilitate us as they did with last week, especially yes. seeing as how yes. we have a mini exam today. Yes. Um, if you would push back the due date for the lab done. to two days. Done. Thank Already you. done. Have a look. So the due date is Monday, as opposed to, you know, this afternoon. Yeah. But good point. I'm glad you raised it, but it has already been done. Yeah. All right. So let's now have a look at the heart. But, but good looking out. And always remember, if you do, you know, you see something and, you know, you would like, once it's within reason, I, I would have no problem, you know, adjusting accordingly. So always don't feel any... Um, hesitancy, you know, to expressing your thoughts in a, in a kindly manner. All right, so we'd now be, in terms of the lab section, we'll be looking at your heart, the heart. So, Heart, very important because it's a major organ. And what organ system does the heart fall into? Cardiovascular. Right, the cardiovascular system. Cardiovascular system, heart and its associated vessels. Now, when you're thinking of the heart associated with the heart, it's cardiac muscle. And the cardiac muscle in terms of their appearance, they're short, fat, they're uninuclear, right? They have one nucleus. And most critically, they're striated. Also, in notwithstanding the striations or the striped nature of cardiac muscle, they have these darkened bands, which are known as intercalated discs. And these intercalated discs, as shown here, they are very important when related to the passage of electrical stimulation as related to the electrical activity of the heart. So we'll be getting into that just a little bit. But do remember, these intercalated discs, they play a critical role in terms of passing the electrical stimulus throughout the heart itself. So this is just showing um, the heart muscle. This is uh, another image shown here. It has a great deal of mitochondria, as we would expect. Why would it have a great deal of mitochondria? Mitochondria are responsible for what type of action? They do what? Energy. Energy, thanks a lot. Yeah, they produce energy. And does the heart ever stop? No. Well, dot, 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 right? That's the only time it will stop. Naturally, I should rephrase that question so it doesn't stop. So therefore, you have this constant supply of um, my, of energy, and therefore the mitochondria, you know, mitochondrial supply um, is critical. Even when we are sleeping, right, the uh, autonomic nervous system it does take take over, and it keeps our heart rate back. Well, not only when we are sleeping, but it is under autonomic nervous control. I was looking recently at um, a video on TV, some documentary on the animal planet, and they were talking about turtles. Now, you know, turtles actually sleep under the water. Yes? Really, sir? Yeah. Yeah, turtles sleep. So when you think about sea turtles, if they, you know, if they're in the middle of the sea, or what have you now, you know, they, they find some area of buoyancy and, and they actually sleep. They fall asleep under the water. But this is the amazing thing. So back to this autonomy. When they're running out, when they're running out of oxygen in terms of in their circulatory system, there's a reflex action that occurs. Now they're still a sleeper eh? that moves the turtle, that causes the turtle to go up to the surface and breathe in, and then it'll go back under the water. Isn't that just absolutely amazing? And the, the turtle is yes, it is so. <laughs> turtle is asleep, <laughs> right? But when the, and again that points, you know, to the brain stem and the chemoreceptors when it realizes the carbon dioxide levels going up, right? It triggers this reflex action, then and it, it will surface, breathe in and go back down under the water. Absolutely incredible. But yeah, I know what some people think. And yes, they do. You also, they also are on land, but this is when they're in the sea, you know, and I said they're going on a, a long journey or what have you. This is, they fall asleep then under the water. Absolutely incredible. I found that so fascinating. Let's go forward. So 
cardiac muscle in terms of the contraction, muscle only have one type of movement associated with them, and that is contraction. Once the electrical stimulus is applied to it, the muscle contracts. And you looked at that in SNF1 when you're looking at the nervous system itself. So the cardiac muscle, once this stimulus is applied, it has its contraction. And where does this stimulus come from? Well, the stimulus comes from one particular area of the heart known as the SA node. And we talk about that in, a, in the next four slides. For now, let's have a look at the gross anatomy of the heart. The heart is located in an area known as the mediastinum. The mediastinum is the area between the, uh, between the two lungs. And if you're looking here, this PA, these are two, well, first of all, blood enters via the SVC. Both the SVC and the IVC, they empty into the RA. So what does SVC and IVC stand for? Superior and inferior vena cava, right? So the blood enters via the superior and inferior into the right atrium. From the right atrium, it goes to the right ventricle. Then it goes to the left and right lung via the pulmonary arteries. Very interesting. You might be saying, well, sir, in terms of the arteries, arteries, don't, arteries carry oxygenated blood, but this blood is coming from the systemic circulation, so it's relatively low in oxygen. What's going on there? In terms of the nomen... Yes, yeah? Go ahead. So you say that the, the blood come from both, both the inferior and the superior? Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. So the inferior, let me clarify mm -hmm. that. So the vena cava, the vena cava is so named, the inferior vena cava, this is blood that is returning, both of them returning blood from the systemic circulation. When it's returning from below the level of the heart, it returns via the inferior vena cava. When it's coming from above the level of the heart, it returns via the superior vena cava. So if, it, if you're looking over here, for instance, this is the superior, there's the inferior vena cava, and they both empty into the right atrium. Yeah? So both of them empty and they both form part of the systemic circulation. So the blood empties in the right atria, goes in, goes through to the right vent, goes down, sorry, to the right ventricle. From the right ventricle, it then moves to the pulmonary artery. So-called because in terms of naming, naming convention, blood that leaves the heart, usually arteries leave the heart, veins bring blood to the heart. So they decided we'll go with that naming convention. And this is the only exception in the body. Normally arteries carry oxygenated blood with the exception of the pulmonary artery. There's the only one that carries the oxygenated blood. And similarly, veins carry deoxygenated blood with the exception of the pulmonary vein. Pulmonary vein is returning blood from the lungs. And the reason why they um, call it the pulmonary vein, because they follow the convention that you know veins bring bring blood back to the heart itself. So here is showing the gross anatomy of the heart. Notice it has this fat around it, right? Fat is for the protection. And this is the pericardium. The word pericardium from peri around and cardi or cardia, referring to the heart. What other term, if I were to ask you certain terms, what term refers to lungs? Pulmonary. Pulmonary, right, or pulmo, right? You'll hear that prefix. Pulmonary refers to lungs. What about liver? Hepatic. Hepatic. Hepatic, Hepatic quite good. What about bone? I, in terms of doctor, what's a bone doctor call? It have to, well, bone, there are two words, both of them beginning with O. Osteo somebody. It's osteo, but a bone doctor is called not an osteo, um, but O-R, it rhymes with orthopedic. Orthopedic. Yeah, so you'll have like an orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Now, Mark, you, I kid you not, Charles, that one always ties me up like a market crab. I always, because what immediately comes to mind is osteo, and I was thinking like, um, is it an orthopedic? And I get tied up immediately. But it's ortho, you know, an orthopedic surgeon. Oftentimes you'll hear the term. And um, these are persons, sure. yes, so it's a, it's I a bone, about in my brain. you know, with osteo, yeah, I, it, it ties me. I, 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 not all the time, but sometimes I get mixed up with the two terms. But they both osteo and also do refer to bone. So the heart within this um pouch that actually uh keeps it uh prevents friction to the lungs because the lung is right behind it, so it has this pouch 
which has um, uh, fluid in it that actually prevents it prevents the friction from occurring. Now we're looking at the gross anatomy of the heart. This heart shown here, this is a preserved specimen, right? So this is from a cadaver, right? And that's why it has this kind of yellowish brown appearance. This is re this is alive, you know, a recently cut heart, and this is showing them the muscle, the heart muscle, or the myocardium. Notice the endocardium. This is where blood. So this is the inside of the heart. This is the, the endocardium is more intimately associated with blood that flows in the heart. And then you have the epicardia or the outer layer that serves as protection on the outside of the heart. So this is uh, showing then, you know, the different valves. Yes, the blood flows in the heart. And why does the heart have valves? One word to prevent what? Backflow. Backflow, backflow yeah. And backflow. If you, if you did, a, mm -hmm, go ahead. You know how they say it have bicuspid and tricuspid valve, right? Mm -hmm. So one is the right and one is the left mm -hmm. atrioventricular valves. Mm -hmm. But I just get mixed up which one is left and which one is the right. I know bi means two and mm -hmm. the um, tricuspid one is because it has like three divisions. But right, which one flaps. is which? Yeah. Uh, so, the, so the bicuspid is the one that has... Uh, two flaps associated with it, and the tricuspid is one that have three. So that's a good question. And you are not alone in that regard in terms of the bicuspid and the tricuspid. I know down right. So the right side is the tricuspid and the bicuspid is on the left side as it relates to the valves. Right? How, how I remember it is try and buy. Tri has an R in it, yeah? So R I, I think R for me time I see the R I know is on the right side. R I as in right, yeah. right side. And the bicuspid, <laughs> right, is on the left <laughs> by by method of elimination. Okay, that's a very good question you asked there. So the right atrial, from the right atrium, you have the SA node, and this is where the initiation of that electrical impulse occurs. The superior and inferior vena cavas, vena cava, right? These are the blood vessels. So I wonder if we have one, um, because Charles, Charles asked a good Achisa. question there. Yes, go ahead. I just, uh, I just want to get this right, right? So, okay. Mm -hmm. So you say, so you say the veins, the blood, the blood in the veins go back to the, to, to the heart, right. return to right. the heart. Mm -hmm. And you say that the arteries, you say the arteries, the, the blood, take blood away. The arteries, take the blood away from the heart. Mm -hmm. All right, I just want to get that right. So. With the exception of the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. So there, there's one exception to that rule. So the arteries take blood, you're quite right. Arteries take blood away from the heart and they also carry oxygenated. The blood that is inside the arteries are oxygenated with the exception of the pulmonary artery. The blood is deoxygenated in the pulmonary artery. And similarly, veins bring back blood and it's deoxygenated with the exception of the pulmonary vein. The pulmonary vein actually carries oxygenated blood. Yeah. So, but let me ask this, mm -hmm. right? So, so what does what does change the the deoxygenated blood to oxygenated blood? That's a very good question. Very good question. So this is the pulmon. So the blood is coming here. This is an X-ray, right? The blood is coming via the superior and inferior vena cava. It's entering the heart. It's deoxygenated. From here, it goes via the pulmonary artery to the lungs. When it reaches the lungs, that is when, well, actually we, we mentioned it when we are speaking about in respiration just now. When it reaches the lungs, air comes in, goes down the trachea, uh, goes down the bronchi, well, it goes down the trachea, the trachea splits or bifurcates into the two bronchi, gets into the lungs. The oxygen then diffuses into the capillaries and the capillaries then it oxygenates the blood. So all that being said, this pulmonary artery goes to the lungs, it picks up the oxygen and now it returns via the pulmonary vein to the left, well, the left atria, left ventricle, and then it leaves the heart via the aorta. And that's how you actually get oxygen into the, into the blood that is then now circulated throughout the body. So let me say that again. This is oxygen, deoxygenated blood. It comes back via the superior and inferior vena cava. It enters the right side of the heart. It goes to the lungs. 
at the level of the lung, as we looked here at in the respiratory um, lecture, when it goes to the lungs, it picks up oxygen. When it picks up the oxygen, it's returned then via the pulmonary vein to the left atria, left ventricle. Now it leaves the heart via the aorta, and it now goes into the systemic circulation or the circulation that goes throughout the body. You may say that again? Yeah, yes, okay, no problem. Let me see if I can say it again. Maybe I'm using too many terms. Let me see if I can break it down with less terms. The blood returning from the body, right, is coming back into the heart. Right? It comes back via the inferior and superior vena cava. It enters the heart. Now, this blood, it needs to get oxygen. So what does the heart do? And that is why oh, you would hear the term that the heart has a double circulation. What it does, blood coming from the body is pumped to the lungs and is returned to the heart and then is pumped out again into the, uh, to all the cells in your body. So it, it, blood enters the heart twice. It comes in once, it goes to the lungs, it comes back in again, and then it's pumped out to the entire body. Very simply, the blood that comes into or oxygen, this is the blood that... So which means, sir, mm -hmm. so which means sir, that the lungs convert, so which means sir, that the, the lungs convert the oxygenated... Ah, to go on. Oxygenated. There you go. So it's a converter. The, it adds it on, correct. So in other words, then, it's like a... Think about the lungs like a gas station. You know, you need gas, so it goes there. And what does it do? It fill up your tank, right? So the blood, it doesn't have gas. It goes to the gas station and it gets gas. And now it comes back full of gas. And now it could, now when it comes back to the heart, it could now drive all over the place and give off oxygen. When it gives off all the oxygen, it has to come back into the heart. What you do is send it back to the gas station, which is the lungs. It fills it up. It comes back into the heart and it leaves via the aorta and it goes throughout the body, giving off oxygen. Ah, when it runs out of oxygen, it comes back, goes into the heart. What does the heart do? Pump it over to the gas station, which is the lungs, fills it up with oxygen, comes back. Now we could go and give off oxygen all over the place. That making sense? Yes, sir. Yeah, but that's a very good question. And um, it's a very good concept to have clear in your mind. So I'm glad you asked that question. Thanks very much. And let me ask this question. Another question. <laughs> When you're looking at x-rays, it's always important. How do you know what is the left side? Which side here is the left side and which side is the right side? There's the right side or there's the... Which side is the left side? Over here, is the right or the left side? Left side. Uh, no, right side, right, right side. My right will be the patient the right left, and my left, left yeah, will be the patient. Yeah, it's weird, eh? Because when you're facing somebody, is opposite. So your left, as, as, as your colleague rightly say, your left is the patient right. And the patient right is your left because you're facing them, right? So try standing up in front of somebody and tell them raise the left hand. And you realize you raise opposite hands, yeah? That making sense? And another way to actually know when you have a chest x-ray, where the left side is, idea, look for idea. the heart and the apex of the heart. The heart always points in what direction? It points to the left. So, you know, when you look at it, and once you pick up, well, there's the middle. Whenever you see a cloudiness, well, that's where the heart is. So the majority of the cloudiness is on this side because the apex of the heart is down here. So, you know, there's the left side. Also, there's usually an L, if you notice up here as well. There's usually a, you'll see L or R written on the um, <laughs> X-ray too. <laughs> that's another way to know. But notwithstanding that, by looking for anatomical cues, if you look at look for the heart, it always points to the, the majority then of the heart is always on the left side. So that's a nice way to pick up. Well, you know, right away, since this is the, the midline, that this is the left side, over here has to be the right side. Okay? But sir, uh, why the heart in the morning left side? How it, why not in the center? It's in the like, middle? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I never thought about that. I never thought about that. That's a very good question. I, I was wondering if it, um, does, if it need to be on that side to pump more stronger, the blood out more stronger, because you know how the blood goes circling, circling around the body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So well, I was wondering. 
I show if that's anato- right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you look yeah. anatomically, let me see. You have your liver there. You have your intestines. Intestines, small intestines, large intestine. Uh, that's a very good question. I'll, I'll have to look at all the other organs, how they pack in, and see if that is the best space for it. Because one of the things you, you have to appreciate, when you move the ribs and so on, everything is packed in like a very, like, you know, a suitcase. Like you're traveling, you're going to Bago by Charles for the Easter weekend, right? And you know your suitcase full up. When you look at the, um, the chest cavity, all your organs, they're packed in. You know, it don't have like a space. If we're looking, but coming back, why is it on the left side? I just don't know. I, I never thought about that. That's a very good question. Mm-hmm, go ahead. Thank you, sir. You know, I would say, remember mm-hmm. they say the heart by the ribs because the heart needs so much protection, right? Mm-hmm. And remember, if it press the middle of your chest come mm-hmm. down, it have a kind of space, space in it between. Does. And also, ah. you're going to want the heart in the middle. Good point. You're going to want one at the either side. It's either left or center. right. Yeah, right. that's a good and point. I guess um, evolution just said he left better than the right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, yes, yes, yes. I like I like your rationale. True, that is true. Because the rib cage, yeah, it does have a space there, so you couldn't have it in the center because you'll be exposing your heart to damage. It has to be behind the rib cage. So who knows? Maybe evolutionarily, if we look at the next couple hundred thousand, if not million years, who knows if the heart wouldn't be shifted to the middle, and the ribs, you know, grow right across to protect it. Who knows? That's a very good point. But um, that's a very good question, and, I, and I'll see if I could come up with an answer for you by next class day, okay? Okay, sir. That's a very good question, though. All right. So the heart shown here, um, in terms of the vessels, the atria to the top, the v- um, ventricle uh, down to the bottom. Always remember you enter the atria and you leave via the ventricle, right? So the AV, and of course, between them, you have the AV, um, the atrioventricular uh, valve here, right? So the right ventricle. Okay, so you're gonna get the 10 o'clock. Right, so you come in yeah. there. All right. Yeah, so. The, the heart itself, the blood always enters via the atria, goes down to the ventricles. From here, it leaves via the pulmonary veno artery that goes to the lungs. Pulmonary artery, very good, right? Carrying deoxygenated blood, returns via the pulmonary vein, comes in now to the left atria, left ventricle, and it leaves via the major artery that leaves the heart. What is that one? Five letters. It begins and A-O. ends in an A. Aorta. Aorta. Very good, Crystal. Um, very good uh, uh, in terms of the responses. There, the aorta. And what is the blood pressure in the aorta? When you look at the aortic arch, what is the blood pressure found there? Is the one blood pressure that you're very conversant with? You're very familiar with that blood pressure. If somebody tell you blood pressure, what two numbers come to mind? 120 over 80. Correct is right, yeah. So the blood coming directly out of the heart is at 120 over 80 in terms of the blood pressure. And it leaves via the aorta. Now, the aorta, there is a division of the aorta, the left and right coronary arteries. The heart is an organ, it pumps blood. But you have to remember the heart is made up of tissue. So this tissue itself, as shown in the back here, it needs to get blood in order to survive. And therefore you have these coronary arteries, is a branch over the aorta that brings blood to the tissue or the muscle of the heart to keep it alive. If it wasn't getting any of this blood supply, the heart would shrivel up and die. The left coronary artery, it subdivides into the the anterior interventricular artery and the circumflex, the right coronary artery splits up into the right marginal and the posterior interventricular artery. So these are shown on the outer part of the heart and they bring the blood supply to the heart, the muscle itself. And this is the distribution as shown here in terms of these major arteries and where that blood supply goes to, all right? So these are they shown here. And we notice as well the red 
that represents the coronary artery. The blue represents the coronary vein. I know I've asked this ad nauseum, but I will do it again. Is blood ever blue? No, no, sir. No, sir. No, sir. What would happen if ever you, you let's say in theater or for whatever reason you're working on a, um, in casualty, somebody come in and on the gurney, when they put them on the gurney and when you look at the bed sheets, so or if you look on the gurney, you see blue blood, what do you do? Run. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, keep running. <laughs> Something is drastically wrong, right? Because we never, we never bleed blue. All right. Very important there. Let's get to the heart. We mentioned gross anatomy of the heart in terms of its valves. And as your colleague quite rightly mentioned, how not to mix them up, the tri and the bi. Tricuspid has an R, so you think R for the right side, and the bicuspid is on the left side. And the reasons you do have these valves in place is to prevent the backflow. If you did have backflow, that would interfere with the blood pressure that is built up in the heart. You wouldn't have blood pressure building up at all. All right, so this is just showing the tricuspid found on the right side. All right, so the pulmonary versus the systemic circulation. Pulmonary circulation refers to blood going to what organ? I forgot. Pulmonary refers to which organ? Lungs. Lungs, Lungs. right. And the systemic refers to the blood going throughout the entire body. All right, so first of all, deoxygenated blood comes in via the inferior and superior, what? VC. Vena cava. Vena cava, right? So they come in via the inferior, sorry, the superior above, inferior below, vena cava, and they go into what part of the heart? R-A? Right atrium. Right, atrium. right atrium. That is at the top. The atria is the welcoming area. When you go into a hotel, the Hilton or the Hyatt, that area where you see the people behind the desk, that is known as an atrium. Right, atrium, it just means a welcoming area. So therefore, always remember when blood is coming into the heart for the first time or returning from the lungs, it goes into the atria, not the ventricle. It doesn't go down the ventricle. First of all, if it does go into the ventricle, that means something is wrong with the heart, right? Some kind of congenital abnormality, but it always goes in normally into the atria. From the atria, it goes down to the ventricle. So from the inferior vena cava goes into the right atria, right ventricle. Then it's going to the lungs via which structure? The pulmonary artery or vein? Artery. Pulmonary artery. Okay. Very good. Goes to the lungs. Gas station. It gets its gas, which is the oxygen, right? So it not only full up, it, so it's full up with oxygen now, which it has to carry to the tissue. It's full up. So it returns now to the left atria via which, which vessel? Pulmonary artery or vein? Pulmonary vein. Right, so it's carrying now oxygenated blood. It returns via the pulmonary vein. It goes to the left atria, left ventricle, and it leaves the heart now via which structure? The biggest artery the, in the, the blood. Aorta. The, the aorta. aorta. Yeah, that's a big one, right? The aorta. That is how blood flows through the heart, right? We're talking about the circulatory system, circulation of the blood. Now let's talk about the cardiac conduction system. How does the heart beat? Well, the heart has a normal rhythm associated with a doom, do, 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 do. And of course, the boom, that's really the valves you hear, do, 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 the beating. SA node, this is where the impulse initiates or starts, the SA node. As I mentioned to you, how I often remember it, SA is for South Africa. You know, when you hear drum, we think about drums, you think about Africa. Uh, South Africa comes to mind, SA node. So SA, whenever I think about, you know, the heart and that rhythm that keeps it going, think about Africa, South Africa, SA, SA for sinoatrial node. All right, so that's how, you know, you always remember that's where the, the, the impulse, it initiates. All of these other things, they help spread it. The AV node, it delays the signal. The branches, you have the branch bundles and the Purkinje fibers. They all help with the spreading of that electrical impulse throughout the heart, such that the heart beats or contracts all at once uh, and then relaxes. If it didn't, it will go into something known as fibrillation, which is just quivering. It quivers like jello on a plate is the example that they say, you know, you're shaking jello on a plate. And to get it out of fibrillation, what do you have to use? You have to use a uh, device known as a 
not a A fibrillator, not a B fibrillator, not a C fibrillator, but a a D fibrillator. Yeah, to shock them. And so, incredible. Go ahead. Sorry, one thing I read in some of the notes they give me that they call the um sinoatrial node the pacemaker. Correct. So when they give you a pacemaker to keep mm -hmm. your heart be pumping is because mm -hmm. that little <clears throat> drum in the heart not working good then. Correct is right. I like the parallel. I like your logical deduction. Yeah. So some persons they have issues with their SA node um, in terms of um, sometimes it gives off irregular beats. What comes to mind? Um, two persons. There's this, there's this footballer um, over. He played for he was playing against Tottenham. I forgot his name. His name eludes me right now. But literally, he just um, he just stopped on the field, you know, and dropped down. This is during a match, you know, and dropped Kristen down. Erickson, sir, that was oh, that last was, year. Oh, oh, and he, they thought he was going to die. Right. It was. Yeah. He has a pacemaker now. He recently come back out playing football. He, yeah. He was. He is another example. I was thinking of, of one even before then. When they were playing again, so maybe Tottenham have something with them because yeah, Christian Eriksen, yeah, he is one. And interestingly enough, as you mentioned, Christian Eriksen, he couldn't play in Europe because persons who have who have an implanted pacemaker is not allowed in the European Union. They can't play professional football, but in England they could. Go figure, you know, because they think it's too much of a risk, so they do allow them to play professional foot, um, football in the state in in Europe. So he had to come back to England to actually play. Yeah, and in fact, he's he's currently playing um, because they, they play Tottenham, decided, is it Burnley? I think he plays for now. They're playing Tottenham this morning and he's playing. But I am sure, um, I don't know if his wife or significant other, you know, watches with her, you know, <laughs> because it's something else really to see. Uh, somebody just collapsed, you know, on a pitch where that is concerned. But but very good observation as it relates to the implanted pacemaker. Yeah, there's some persons who have issues here. So what it does, the implanted pacemaker, it detects when it is not sending impulses correctly and it takes over. And it will also send a shock to the pacemaker. And when it detects that, okay, is it's, you know, sending impulses correctly, it cuts off. So everything is done automatically and before the way it reaches the point where the person collapses you know yeah let me see I, I was thinking about that other person the reason why i remember it was a england international oh. uh, excuse me so go ahead so so concerning any atrium so the blood the blood came into does come into the both atrium simultaneously or or individually, sir? Simultaneously, yeah. So in terms of filling, yeah. So it's filled simultaneously, left and right. But they all they come from different areas. They come from the uh, systemic circulation, and then the other one is coming from the lungs, the pulmonary circulation. Mm -hmm. It's not, where is it? Uh, the person I was thinking about is Fabrice Muamba. This happened in 2012. <laughs> that was a older one, but you're right, Christian Erickson. That happened just last year. And that was some, uh, that was really something else. But Fabrice Muamba in 2012, with him, it were, they were playing against Tottenham and he just dropped on the pitch. And in fact, interestingly, he was legally dead for um for about 86 minutes he was legally dead what does illegally dead mean it means then that your heart isn't pumping so therefore they were doing cpr on him um for 86 keeping him alive for approximately 86 minutes you know and then they got him onto a ventilator and incredibly there's where they, you know your body the machine this is why it's so incredible your body just start it start his heart started back what was very um fortunate for Fabrice Muamba is that a, a specialist cardiologist was in fact in the in the um in the audience you know was watching the game so from the time he saw him drop 
And he was, he see, you know, he could tell certain things. He knew from the way he dropped, he was like, whoa. And he started, he started to run out onto the pitch. Not with sign, any fact that, of course, they have their physicians and so on. But they immediately took him. Uh, I, I'll send you the link. It has a whole story on BBC, on BBC about the Febreze Muamba thing. You know, it, it was very dramatic. Yeah, because he wasn't breathing. This, uh, you know, it stopped. His breathing actually stopped altogether, Febreze Muamba. But long story short, he got implanted, but he didn't go back to play football, though. Yeah, according to them, his fiance tell him, yeah, that's not a good idea at all. So I'll send you that link, yeah, at the end of class. Okay, let's go on. So ECG, ECG, this is a means of measuring the electrical activity of the heart. And let's have a look at these four ECGs here. Now, the ECG forms what is known as a PQRST wave. So named because when you look at it, uh, different parts or intervals tell you different things about the heart itself. PQRST waves, this is a whole specialization in itself that cardiologists usually um, spend a lot of time on. And just by looking at the trace, they could actually tell which part of the heart if something is wrong. Usually you have a normal trace if something is off. They could detect it. Let's see. So these are some of the simpler traces. Let's see if you could pick it up. Now, compared to this normal heartbeat, so this is the wave trace. Did you all, I'm not, you all haven't done it yet in terms of lead placement yet for ECG. You all haven't done that in Skills Lab, no? No, sir. No, right. So that'll be upcoming. Yeah, you'll be, you'll be doing that in your Skills Lab. We're talking nursing, right? In terms of the placement of the leads. So when you place the leads, you're able then to detect the current coming from the heart. We mentioned the SA node generates an electrical current and the spreading throughout the heart. It could be detected by placing leads in certain parts of the body. And this is what is actually done to generate these waves. Compared to this, what would you say is different? Just by using your eyes and saying, okay, these are, you could say spikes, comparing spikes and uh, call this part the flats. So you're comparing spikes and flats. What is the difference between a normal heartbeat and a fast heartbeat? What would you say? What has changed? The spikes closer, the interval between them. Very good, yeah. So you have more spikes. Here are the spikes. We have one, two, three, four, five, six spikes. And here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine spikes. Right, so it's a different day in terms of the spikes, and you're quite rightly the intervals are smaller. So that's a fast heartbeat, also known as is a word that beginning with T. I think we, I think we, we mentioned it in lecture. Tachycardia, sir. Tachycardia, yes. Okay. Right. For the, yeah, so like in the car, there's an instrument known as a tachometer. So the tachy part is actually refers to fast or speed. Right. So fast heartbeat. This refers to tachycardia. Whereas in this case, what is the difference when you look at a normal and a slow heartbeat in terms of the spikes and the intervals? What could you say? Yeah, the spikes and the intervals wider. Right, the intervals are wider and you have fewer spikes. Very good. If you were comparing now the irregular heartbeat to a normal heartbeat, what could you say? So have a mixture of both the fast and the slow. Correct. What could you say about the spikes? Some high and some low, sir. Oh, yes. Look at the height. Same. Yeah. Some high, high and some level. low, so you have it. Even though you have the same number of spikes, this is six and six. But with this one, you have some that are a little lower. Notice that these are touching the line, these four here. But these two are a little below the line itself. Right? And it is a mixture in terms of the intervals. Some are close and then some are further apart. Very good. Do pay attention to this. You will see this again in some form or fashion, right? And it would be asked just simply those same, like questions along those lines in terms of how you could tell the difference among them. You'll just be asked, you know, well, and also to identify based on a normal, to identify which one is tachycardia, bradycardia, and irregular heartbeat. That's a favorite question to come. You will see it, I assure you, okay? Right, so this is the heart itself. As you mentioned, the different parts of the wave, the PQRST wave. And based on this, they could tell if you have issues with your heart. And that is where the cardiologist comes in. It's a whole specialty in and of itself. 
So this is but, showing. Uh, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Um. It, so I didn't realize that with the tachycardia and the bradycardia, mm -hmm. right? Which I was thinking were already irregular heartbeats. That there is another one that oh yeah is considered irregular. Correct. So, So they don't do in class um, a fast heartbeat as being irregular. I understand what you're saying. Yes. So this is just showing in term, these terms that are put here. So there are other specific terms associated with them. So like a fast heartbeat is tachycardia, slow heartbeat is bradycardia. When they say irregular, it means really like a combination of the two, a fast and slow. But it is all of these are considered, I hear what you're saying, Charles, all of these are considered irregular heartbeats. Yes. yes sir. All of them um, are irregular heartbeats. Yes, but specifically, what they're saying is, you know, yeah, in terms of this comparison that they use here, this was fast, this one is slow, and this one is irregular as it relates to it being a combination of the two. Understood. Right? Okay, no problem. Right? So we mentioned fibrillation. So as I said, if you once you know what you're looking for, right, you can actually detect it. Earlier in class, somebody mentioned that how, you know, when they carry their, their, their son, you know, to the doctor and he was wheezing straight away, you know, he was, the doctor was able to say, Psh, asthma, you know. So similarly, when cardiologists, so when you're trained, you can actually just look at this and you could say fibrillation. I mean, something is wrong with the heart in terms of when they hook it up to the ECG and, ooh, yeah, your heart went to fibrillation there. It did kick back in, but yeah, it's going into fibrillation. I'm not supposed to happen. It's supposed to have a constant beat all the time. And so now when you say fibrillation, I just think jello. <laughs> yeah, it's, your heart is quivering. It does because, you know, it's because it's confusion happening. You know, I always like to think about it, you know, back to your sports. Like when you're marching everybody in rhythm, now just think about it that you don't know rhythm. I know it's had some people... As I said, they didn't have boy, boy days or girl days, and they didn't used to run and thing. And if you ever see some people running, you know, normally when you run, right, you know, you know your right hand runs, is, how does it go? Is your right hand runs with your left leg, you know, opposites. You ever see some people that run, <laughs> like your right leg moving with your right hand and the left, and it's not kind of funny running. You can tell they didn't have boy days. Like people who not accustomed running, then they, they're running this, a very strange pattern, right? So similarly, you can actually detect when you see this funny pattern, irregular pattern, you can tell from experience that that end is fibrillation. In terms of the sounds of the heart, you have this lub dub sounds and the lub, the lub dub, they're associated with the valves and they're closing in terms of the sounds that they make. You could go to YouTube to hear it, just type in YouTube, heart sounds, it have a lot of a lot of um, a lot of these things, you know, actually they're relating to sounds. All right. So blood pressure, more blood enters, increases this with stroke volume and heart rate, less blood leap. It's always important to keep your blood pressure up, right? Which is why when your blood pressure begins to significantly drop, what does your body go into? A word that begins with S ends into K and ends in K, no. yeah. it goes into shock. And when you go into shock, do you remain standing or do you collapse? You collapse because you collapse. you're um, not getting enough oxygen and blood flow to your tissues. And it's things. a compensatory mechanism. Yeah, I know it's a compensatory mechanism as well. It's easier to move blood around your body when you're in a prone position or lying down. And when you're standing up, your heart has to work more. So it's a compensatory mechanism. Your blood really, your heart, your body is realizing back to the brain stem, you have your respiratory center. Look, I'm not pumping enough. And you know, I'm trying, right? And it's not, it's not happening. So what happens? Hmm, you know what? Let me move to plan B. Clearly, you know, I'm not moving enough oxygen around. Let me get me do myself down into a prone position so I could actually bring my heart rate down and uh, while still increasing pressure. So that's why usually for shock, when you're going to shock, you will just drop. In a prone position, you can move the blood around easier throughout your body, as opposed to when you're standing, there's more effort needed by the heart itself. So, so shock and syncope is the same thing or two different things? Shock and syncope, are they the same thing? 
Anybody wants to comment on that? So uh, syncope is fainting and nausea, I believe. Mm -hmm. So syncope is also known as fainting, that's quite right. Um, could you have syncope without going into shock? Uh, I think, yes, yeah, sometimes some people faint without actually. When you go into shock, do you always pass out? Now, that's another good question. When you go into shock, do you go unconscious? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. So, so in other words, you could parallel. So, to answer your question, Charles, uh, it's a uh, sometimes. So sometimes you could when you have when you are when you go into shock, you could go unconscious. Sometimes you cannot. With syncope, similarly, sometimes you could go unconscious. Sometimes not. So it all you'll have to define it specifically. Then you know that say okay, syncope with going unconscious or, or shock with going unconscious then, you know, you have to be specific when you do yes, use sir. the I've seen that, I've seen the analysis. Yeah, well, that's a very good question you asked there. All right. So blood pressure, uh, systolic and diastolic. Pulse pressure, of course, you take your pulses at specific uh, parts of the body itself. And that instrument that is used to measure it, you all will do it in the skills lab, the sigma manometer. Um, how is it pronounced? Just like, just S with a banana. What's another name for a banana? Fig, sir. Right, <laughs> right. So, fig. <laughs> You know, it, 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 so you pronounce it S F I G. You know, sphygmo manometer, right? And this is used uh, the inflatable cuff. Y'all will y'all will learn because it's on the curricula in terms of your skills. It, you would learn the manual one, even though now you'd recognize when you go you do go to the wards. Um, virtually everybody's used the automatic one. Where you just put it and you leave it alone, right? And it it does everything for you, but. Practically, sometimes, you know, somebody borrow it and you will need it. So sometimes it is good to actually know how to do it manually in terms of the blood pressure. All right. And that's where we would end class for today as it relates to the lab itself. OK. No, not end it. Well, end in the lab as it relates to this one. All right. So the last thing what we want to do, I just want to review the lab sheet from last day. Okay, any questions? Nope. No, sir. All right. Excuse me, so which lab sheet is that? Sorry. <laughs> we had a lab sheet from last day, or I'm making it up. I know we had one with Miss Miss Something and She Blood, but that was from the first, first class. Yeah. That one? Let me see it. Yeah. So when I say last, yeah, it's from the first, first class, the one that we didn't look at. <laughs> 